Okay, thanks everyone for coming to the Spine Conference. Uh, just a reminder, I'm going to record the conference and everything goes on the internet, so especially you, Cammie, because you really mouth out, just you know, be careful with your comments, okay? okay. Make them PG or G-rated. So I, I decided to go over uh, anterior cervical discectomy fusion <laughs> because um, it's a very common operation and um, um, it's something that we can study. So just as a brief um, description of the nervous system, everybody knows, uh, or maybe they don't, <clears throat> the nervous system essentially is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. And the spinal cord ends around L1, L2 most of the time. Um, emanating off the spinal cord and the brain, there are nerves. And in the brain, we call them cranial nerves. And then from the spine, we call them spinal nerves. And they go into our extremities and they basically help us communicate, help our body sense things and help us affect things, move our limbs, feel things. Now, we're gonna talk about cervical spine because we're talking about anterior cervical discectomy infusion. In the cervical spine, uh, here's the brain, uh, um, spinal cord, bones, the vertebral bodies. In between each vertebral body or bone in the neck, there's a disc, which is a soft tissue uh, structure which gives the neck motion and also sort of a shock absorber. Um, if you look at the bones in the neck, here's the spinal canal where the spinal cord runs. Uh, this hole is um, frame and transversarium where the vertebral artery runs into your brain. Um, and here's a, the MRI of the uh, axial cut. You can see the spinal canal and this central circle here is the spinal cord itself. And here's the vertebral artery within the frame and transversarium. So these are just basic concepts. So you can hear here everyone, this is a, this is a side view of the model of the neck. And this is uh, looking down the spinal canal, and this is my secretary crystal, and you can see, you can look all the way through, it's a spinal canal, it's a tube where the spinal cord can run. And here's where the vertebral artery runs. It enters this area at C6, usually, but sometimes it can enter at C7. That's something that we have to remember as spine surgeons. So what can happen to the neck? What are the disease processes? You can have a degenerative disc. You can have radiculopathy, which is pain down the arm. You can have stenosis or compression of the spinal cord within the canal. You can have spondylolisthesis, the bones are sliding. You can have adjacent segment generation, a level below or above uh, an area of interest. Like if you fuse someone, the level above can get this, uh, um, adjacent segment generation, which is significant. You can have instability, the bones sliding in some manner, causing a problem. You can have a deformity, scoliosis, kyphosis, excessive lordosis. You can have a herniated disc into the spinal cord or the foramen, compressing the nerve, and you can have a non-union of bone. So these are most of the problems. <coughs> so I have this list for uh, pain generators. So where can pain come from? It can come from the disc itself. It can come from the spinal canal. It can come from the foramen where the nerve runs out. And it can come from the facet where the two bones in the neck come together. Can anyone think of any other pain generators in the neck, the spine? So it's kind of just... The cord itself, I guess. The cord itself, so the spinal... So if you have um, spinal cord compression, that causes axial neck pain. So that's not written in any textbooks, but in real life, when people have cervical stenosis, like a tumor, uh, they say, my neck hurts. And then you find the compression of the spinal cord. And a lot of cervical stenosis patients say, my neck hurts. And what happens is because it's a chronic condition and it occurs very slowly over years, they usually don't say my neck hurts, but at some point they do. So you're right. So spinal. And then the dura, if it's inflamed. And the dura can get inflamed. That's another pain generator. Okay. So where where do people say it hurts? They usually point to the back of the neck, and it can radiate to the top of the head, the occipital area. So you can have cervical genic headaches. Um, this is where the facets hurt. So if you're, this is a study, great study, um, where they injected saline into facets and in medical students, I think. And then they said, where does it hurt? So you can see these are the areas 
Now, the most common FETs, facets that have problems are C5, C6, and C6, C7, because that's where all the motion is. And you can see where it hurts in the trapezial area and in the uh, periscapular area. And that's usually the chief complaint when I have cervical discs, is they say, I have pain here in the trapezial area and the uh, periscapular area. But it can also be in different areas. C2, C3 is by the, the, behind the ear. C3, C4 is the side of the neck. And these are the uh, dermatomes. I'll go over the dermatomes. And the dermatome, this, so these are facets. Discs are usually axial. Now these are the dermatomes connected to the nerve root. So let's just pick one, the C6 goes to the side of the arm, to the thumb, and the index finger. So, does anybody here have any cervical radiculopathy right now? No, okay. Do you? Where is yours? Where do you feel it? Um, mostly uh, ulnar distribution. Ulnar, so C8. So, when you say ulnar, you mean like your little finger? Yeah, little finger and half, half the end of the ring finger. Okay, so that's classic uh, C8 dermatoma distribution, which would be between the C7, T1 disc space, or it could be ulnar nerve. I have the same problem, but it's ulnar nerve. I was, um, I'm one of those old people, whenever I have uh, arthritic problems, I always say it's from my college years from playing sports. It's probably just because I'm getting old, but I had a dislocation when I was in college of my elbow play wrestling, and ever since then I say it's a wrestling injury, but it's probably I'm just getting old. We always say it's from our college uh, injuries, but usually it's just arthritic. So some people can have myelopathy. So, the, and myelopathy presents as a clumsiness, and it's usually something people don't tell you unless it's severe. Uh, clumsy, clumsiness when they walk, they trip, they fall. Um, it can be of their lower extremities, uh, or it can be in their hands. Um, and it's usually a very mild thing. They drop objects like coffee cups or things. I mean, you remember a coffee cup because it's a hot substance. And, um, but it can present severe. Like one woman said that she had a hard time feeding herself. She couldn't eat because her hands weren't working. And um, so this is more just the spinal canal, the lamina, the vertebral arteries. And on a front view, most of the um, foraminal stenosis come from the uncus. So this part here communicates with this part here from the next vertebra. So it, it sort of cups each, they cup each other. And this bone gets big in people and compresses the nerve as it exits the hole for the nerve, which is called the foramen. So this is the uncus, and this is a, a, an area that gets compressed commonly. So things can masquerade as cervical radiculopathy. So a C5 nerve root can masquerade as a rotator cuff impingement. C6, C7, uh, a, it can present as carpal tunnel syndrome. C7 nerve root can be a posterior interosseous nerve problem. C8 nerve root um, could be an anterior interosseous nerve or cubital tunnel problem, remember elbow? So it could be ulnar nerve at the elbow or it could be C8. You can have a double crush syndrome, uh, so a pressure somewhere else in either your brain or your neck can accentuate a lower problem. So I've frequently had, actually yesterday's case of mine, uh, the man presented with sciatica, bilateral sciatica. In fact, it wasn't lumbar, it was uh, cervical. He had severe cervical stenosis, and it, it exacerbates the lower condition. So when you do the cervical stenosis surgery, the lower condition gets better, so the back pain goes away. So I had another, another case, the man came in, he had low back pain. In fact, it was cervical stenosis. And, I, he, and this, he, he said to me, so you're doing a surgery on my neck to make my back pain go away? Does that make any sense? I was like, yeah, you gotta trust me on this. It's gonna work, and, and it did, luckily. Uh, and also, um, you can have angina that, that you may think it's cervical, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, RSD, or thoracic outlet. And these are things that can mimic as myelopathy, uh, ALS, myelitis, multiple sclerosis, demyelinating conditions, something in the brain, uh, syringomyelia, Chiari. So I like to do um, illustrative cases so we can go over them and it helps us learn. So. This is a 75-year-old woman who says her left upper extremity hurts and she has a hard time walking, ataxia. So, Adam, can you explain to everyone what we see here on the x-rays? Well, we'll start out with the one in the middle where your cursor is. That's our lateral radiograph. Mm -hmm. And uh, the you can see the posterior, well, you can see C1 and countdown, so C1. Um, C1, C2 is normally pretty good. C2, C3 there is, is good. C3, C4, there's pretty good height. And then at C4, C5, that disc height right there becomes narrowed. Mm -hmm. You can see the anterior osteophytes that are forming off of the uh, bone. So that 
He's showing that there is there is a disprotrusion anteriorly, and often when there's a disprotrusion anteriorly, there's a suspect for a disprotrusion posteriorly as well. And right there, where you, have, you can see the osteophytes are forming um, from the end plate. So that's when the, the common term I use on MR because I can't s differentiate between bone and disc material. I say I just use one word: bone and disc material extend posteriorly into the spinal canal. Every now and then you can see disc protrusions, but most of the time it's just bone and disc material, a, a generic term, because I can't differentiate. And they're usually black, right? Yes. Unless they're acute, right? An acute disc herniation or protrusion is the term I would use. Well, no, but um, what I'm trying to I'm trying to lead you into something. Okay. What what do um, don't you think you can tell an acute soft disc herniation in the spinal canal because it has a different yes. color? Yes. So, so you, I think you're, what you're more describing is are the chronic cases, they're black. Which, are, which is almost everybody. Which is almost everybody. Yeah. But you do have cases of soft, acute ones, right. especially in young people, that just go, that can go away, you, I feel. Yeah. Yes. I okay. agree. So uh, now let's go to the top left image there. So let's start all the way up at the foramen for 2-3. So you can see the nice big hole of the neural foramen there, the side hole that the nerve comes out. And then we'll go down one, and there's it's another nice round hole. And then you go down the other one, and it's not quite, it's more oval. And then you can see what, what he talked about, the uncus. And at the uncovertebral joint, right above his the arrow point, um, there's the bone there. And it's bowing a little bit into the spinal canal and narrowing it. Now if you come down one level more, you've lost the, the nice round uh, neural foramen, and it's a slit-like thing. And a, most of that is because of the uncovertebral joint, the hypertrophy on that joint, extending posteriorly or posterior laterally into the spinal canal um, at that level. So you got two, three, three, four, four, five. Can five, I six. can I add one more thing? Sure. Another thing that may be a contributor to decrease. So the foramen is the hole where the nerve runs out. Another thing that could be a contributor is the disc heights decrease now. Yeah. So you can imagine, like, just imagine, like, this thing, because the disc is heights decreased, the hole gets. Uh, yeah, lose. shorter yeah. lose height yeah and then you got you have this thing the uncus osteophyte compressing in as well so the combination decreases that hole yes okay so uh, anything else you want to so, comment so on that, Adam? That, that one's that's really the worst disease there how about here Adam what tell everybody what this is and that's the uncovertebral joint there with the <coughs> osteophyte you can see extending off left laterally and that's at the same level um, especially that one on the left there, it's the same level as that uh, mm -hmm. oblique radiograph. Right so here's there. that same uncle osteophyte that goes into the frame. You can see it on the AP view as well. Yeah. And how about, what do you think of the flexion so extensions? The flexion extension views uh, are <coughs> not much. Um, no significant abnormal yeah, motion, right? She, or he or she is she, moving. She. She's moving fairly well. Um, you know, I think a lot of her flexion is coming from the cervical thoracic junction, um, but she's, there's, a, the word I use is excursion, there's good excursion between the flexion and extension piece. Okay, so the neck is moving pretty well, it's not very stiff. And okay. it doesn't evoke an elisthesis. Okay, so no abnormal motion, you would say. So here's a sagittal, oh shoot, hold on. Here's a sagittal cut. Okay, Adam, what do you see? All right. Um, but what I see is the, uh, it's a T2, CSF is um, white, so the water is white, so that makes it a T2 weighted image. And you count down to the, the first oblong vertebral bodies, two, three, four. So at the C4, C5 level, again, it's dark, so I can't tell if it's all just disc or if there's some bone there too. So I would say bone disc material extends posteriorly into the spinal canal. It abuts, displaces, and deforms the cord, and it's likely causing some cord impingement. Uh, yeah, right there at that level. C4, C5. At C4, C5, and so I would say there's a, a cord impingement here. The interesting thing is the cord is the same signal throughout its course. Um, there isn't focal cord edema there, so that I would I would suggest because I don't, but I don't know that it's chronic. That typically, if something were to happen acute and, uh, acutely and right away with a cord impingement like this, you'd anticipate there to be edema within the cord, and there's not. So I would say that it's probably chronic. 
Okay, so sp no spinal cord signal change. So it's compression uh, from the disc herniations at C4, C5, and C5, C6 on these sagittal cuts, right? Yeah. And you can see, remember what you said, Adam? You, see, you can see the ossifites in the front, uh -huh. and then you said, well, the same thing could be happening on the back. Yeah. And you're totally right here on the MRI. Right, and so now we have the axial images, mm -hmm. and we'll go to the uh, top right um, on, the, on the first row, uh, right image. You can see that the, the on the, on the first two images, there is CSF, there's white signal surrounding the cord on all sides. Then the middle image, it's a little bit less in front of the cord. And then on the top right image, you can't see the CSF really surrounding it there. And then you go to the second row, first image, and you can see the cord impingement there. And the disease is more severe on the left than the right, but it's impinging the cord, narrowing that left neural foramen, um, you know, as we uh, saw from the plain film. Okay, so what do we do? So the, the worst areas were C4, C5, C5, C6, and this patient had what we're talking about, anterior cervical discectomy infusion. And uh, here's the front view and the side view of the plate and screws, and I used cortical concellus allograft. So the patient did extremely well. So you may say, what's an anterior cervical discectomy infusion? Well, it's a surgery through the front of the neck, and you uh, the incision usually is, uh, transversely because uh, it makes a very cosmetically pleasing uh, uh, incision because it's through the Langer's lines. Um, and if you look, if you um, someone like me who's kind of, kind of fat, got a scar, yeah, you've got a scar. Do you have a transverse? I have a five six um, fusion. You transverse, right? Five six seven fusion, yeah, and then somewhere over here. He did a left side approach. That you can mm -hmm. barely see. You can't see it really. Uh, yeah, as long as you don't, you don't have a problem for some reason, like you get a keloid or something. And uh, the neck is, um, you can move the incision pretty well because the, the skin is usually loose. And um, I usually use an x ray when I plan the uh, skin incision. So you have to go medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and that's the muscle that goes from your clavicle to the back of your head. So that's the first muscle. You also have to cut through the platysma, and people do it differently. You can either just cut it. I just cut it in line with the skin incision. I don't think it makes a difference, and I repair it on my way out. Some people don't do that. Some people uh, just spread it. So you may say, what's a platysma? That's the platysma. So it's just a, um, we don't, you don't really need a platysma. Um, I, I'm not sure, does anybody know what the platysma does? I think I know what it is. I remember medical schools and chimpanzees use it to threaten other chimpanzees, but I don't think we use the platysma. Maybe Nate does, because he gets pretty angry sometimes. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> deadlifts. Huh, when you do deadlifts? Yeah, <laughs> just to scare the, uh, the women away from you in the gym. And then um, the, next, um, the next two structures are the uh, omohyoid, uh, which some people cut routinely, and that's at C5, C6. Um, and then the next is the um, um, carotid sheath. And inside the carotid sheath um, uh, is, everybody knows, the uh, vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is a very important nerve. It does all sorts of things. Um, can anybody just say one thing uh, that a vagus nerve does? Bowel motility. Bowel motility. Also, um, Swallowing, uh, what other things? Secretion. Vagus nerve, secretions. All about. Yeah. Also, um, heart rate. You know, the vagus nerve. So, what's you guys know what carotid massage is? When you uh, massage the heart, it can slow. Uh, you can massage the carotid area, and it can slow the heart down. Um, okay. So the it's it's right in the carotid sheath, which is the artery to your brain and also the vein. So the dissection is again medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and then medial to the carotid sheath, which we put our finger on and feel it and make sure we're not injuring it. And then you go to the midline, and then you push aside all these things, which I usually call them strap muscles because I can't remember the names of them. Uh, and the uh, windpipe, the trachea, and the esophagus. And then you get right uh, onto the uh, vertebral body. So that's sort of the approach. So one more time, uh, through the platysma, mastoid muscle, the strap muscles, um, uh, you, you, they're medial, and then you go medial to the carotid sheath, um, and then right onto the bone, and then you have the windpipe or the trachea, and then the uh, tube to your stomach, the esophagus. So obviously, any of these things can get injured on the way in for anterior cervical fusion. 
there's more things that could get injured is your recurrent laryngeal nerve. So on the left, uh, it comes off the vagus nerve and then goes um, over the arch of the aorta and then up. And on the right, it doesn't do that. It's got a shorter course. This is very controversial. Neurosurgeons usually do it on the right. Orthopedic surgeons do it on the left. And usually the, the theory is the right side is not as variant, doesn't have as many variants as the left, so there's a higher probability you could injure it on the right. But it's not clear if that's true or not, so I don't even know if it's true. I do left side because I think it's good luck. I've had very good luck, and that's how I was trained, so I haven't switched. But sometimes I do it right if I have a reason to. Does anybody have any comments or opinions about that? Okay. How about people with goiters? Will that, has that ever changed your approach? No. I see a lot of thyroid ultrasounds with people with goiters, and so to me it seems like it's well, like a common... If it's, more, if it's on one side, definitely. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I've never done a cervical fusion on a goiter patient. So you get down to the bone uh, of the spine, here's C5, C6, and in between here is the disc, and you, and you take the entire disc out. On either side uh, is the longest coli, the muscle. So this is the, you'll say, what's the longest coli? This is the longest coli. It's the muscle that's right in front of the spine. And you spread this apart so that you can see the disc. And then you want to put your retractors beneath the longest coli. But there's also something you have to be very careful of. Within the longus coli is a sympathetic plexus. And if you injure that, which you shouldn't because you're, you're putting the retractors deep to that, but if you injure that, you can uh, have uh, Horner's syndrome. So <clears throat> once you get down to the disc, uh, you take the whole disc away with these pituitary rongeurs and kerosene punches. And then this is a high-speed drill. You use a high-speed drill and you drill all the way back, removing those osteophytes that Adam talked about all the way to the level of the posterior annulus. Uh, and I always remove the posterior longitudinal ligament and I look at the dura itself. Not everybody does that. I do it because I want to make sure everything's out. Not everybody does that. People say it's not necessary. But if you don't do it, you could potentially miss a, a disc fragment that has migrated through the PLL uh, and behind the vertebral body. So that's something that I always do. And these are what the curettes look like. Um, these are kind of old curettes, but they have a cup and, they, and you go into the spine and then you lift things away from the spinal cord. So once you take the disc out, let's say these are bones and there's a disc in the middle, you have to weld these two bones together. So you have to fuse them together when you do a fusion. And they become one. So you can use the old way is iliac crest from the front of the pelvis, which kind of hurts. And here's when you cut it out. Um, or you can use cortical cancellous allografts. So the allografts have gotten very good lately. There are composites, and I think they're better than they used to be. They used to be just a piece of fibula that they used to cut, which was all cortical. I think these are just as good as um, uh, your own bone. And this is what it looks like, and then you stick the bone so between from them. Cadavers. They're from cadavers. They're from cadavers, and uh -huh. they're they're human, and um, and they're a composite where they take, I don't know where they take it from, but they take it from different places. And the one that I use looks very much like a, like a spine. It's like the outer part is cortical and the inner part is cancellous. So it's a very natural fit. Why can't they use animal bone? Because it's all denatured uh, pretty much and sterilized. You would think you could in bones because there's no, there are no cells in there. All the major histocompatibility complex uh, cells are gone because they wash them out. I don't know why they don't use animal bones. It's a good question. Does anybody know? Well, we, we use pig. The only one that I know xenografts are pigs, pig valves for hearts. Does anyone know any other xenografts that we use? Oh, uh, for uh, um, burns, for skin grafts, yeah, we use exactly. pig, pig Horsey, skin. Horsey, <laughs> yeah. That is just temporary coverage. That's just temporary coverage, yeah. So the literature report probably the very low rate of you and the fusion if you use uh, zero graft bone. Um, right. so low, low fusion rates low when you use zero graft bone? Yeah, right. I think that's really not a very strong rejection. Strong rejection? So maybe they don't, they can't, in the process, they can't completely clean it, maybe. But it's supposed to be totally cleaned in the process. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they, you know, there's been a lot of um, uh, composite material that they've used. Um, there were, um, Zimmer had a product, it was a coral and a crystalline structure. They were getting it from, uh, you know, seabeds and stuff like that. 
<clears throat> there's been a lot of work with sheep, but basically the, uh, the bones just don't uh, behave properly uh, like human bones. I don't think they get up, you know, because basically if you're putting a dead bone in there, the thing has to become completely resorbed. And then, uh, in five years, it's gone. So if you mark it, a lot of times if you put dead bone or xenograft bone, and it's much harder to for it to uh, resorb. I think. So maybe it's not resorbed get, like human bone. Right, you get like a, a very vigorous inflammatory reaction. Sometimes the thing just disappears, or sometimes you know it just stays. You, you get some cortical struts that just stay there forever. Does everybody understand that? What happens is your osteoclasts class dig into the allograft eat it up and then your osteoblasts lay down new bone in this cutting cone that's how bones uh, remodel so that thing if you mark it with radioactivity in five years it's uh, probably more like eight years it's gone it's like, where is it it's gone it was eaten up and your own bones lay down so then a plate and screws uh, is applied across the bones to sort of increase the fusion rate during the operation we use a microscope and so this is what the microscope looks like. It's this big device that we put right on top of the patient. And the recent microscopes are unbelievable. They're like the difference between driving a Chevy Chevette, which was my car in med school, versus like a Mercedes. It's just unbelievable. They're just very easy to control and just very simple. And the surgeon's looking straight into it like he's in a submarine. But the image goes down onto the patient. And here is what it looks like. The microscope is draped over the patient and it's all covered with plastic so it's sterile. So this is, this is what it looks like. Here's the surgeon, here's the assistant. And you're, you're looking at, you're facing each other, but you're looking down into the patient and you're operating down. And this way the, the assistant has the same view as the surgeon. So it's, it's great visualization. So let me, let me just show you what it's like. This is just, this is not a cervical spine, but it just gives you an idea of uh, how clear and both people see pretty much the same image and that suction tip is about four millimeters and that other instrument uh, that's a kerosene that's a drill remember we talked about the drill that drill bits three millimeters and as part of the procedure you drill away the bone and you're careful you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper towards the spinal cord but because everything's magnified ten times it's very easy to be careful and you just keep drilling, 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 drilling until you get very close. And then once you're very, very close, the last bit, the last portion you take away with like the curette. See how you pull away from the cord? This is not actually the spinal cord, but it shows you the idea. You, you pull upwards away from the neurological structures and tease them away. And then this thing grabs it and pulls it away. That's a kerosene punch. So it, it, it pulls away from the nerves. You don't want to push into the nerves because then you could damage the nerves. You can see what a beautiful image you have with the microscope. How, are you going all the way through? The, so that is the, the, the dura? That's dura, saying? right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is lumbar case, and that's why I'm actually pushing on the nerves because in the lumbar spine, you don't have to worry about it. But in the, in the cervical spine, I would, never be, I would never be this aggressive in my motions. The cervical spine is a lot more delicate. So that's the disc space right there? That's the thecal sac pulsating. What, what I'm saying is between the bone on the left and the bone on the right. You can't see. This is the, this is the facet. Oh. This is the midline. That's the thecal sac. I think this is the nerve root right here exiting. I can't see it. I'm taking, in this case, I'm taking away ligam, uh, ligamentum flavum. And um, that's why I'm pushing up on the dura with the kerosene punch because there's just CSF there. There's no, it's not full of neurological tissue like cervical spine. But it just, this kind of gives you an idea of the technique, like what's it like for microscopic surgery. So any questions about that, the microscope? Okay. So during the cervical spines surgery, we monitor the spinal cord. Um, does anybody have opinions about it, neuromonitoring? monitoring? So some people say it's an absolute waste of time and it doesn't change outcomes. Some people say you need it every single case. Um, I'm somewhere in between. I use it for cervical cases and high-risk cases. And basically they put electrodes on your head and they put electrodes on your feet and arms and they run a current up and down and then here's the guy in the operating room and he watches uh, the, uh, the nerve, nerve tissue. And, uh, and if there's a problem, it should tell us, but it doesn't always work perfectly. But it does work uh, frequently. So they may say there's a problem with the spinal cord and you do things like increase the blood pressure, change your retractors, you know, you check all your screws, your implants, and hopefully it can, it can give you an idea of what's going on. A lot of times it just says the arms are uncomfortable, 
and the patient can't talk to us because he's asleep, so we change the positioning of the arms. So I think it's of some benefit. Do you have any questions about neuromonitoring? The uh, person, the guy there sitting there looking at the monitor, mm -hmm. now is he a hospital employee trained or is he a no. company representative? He represents a company, there's like two or three in the area. I think it costs like a thousand bucks. So that's something the hospital pays out of its own pocket. It comes it comes straight from the bottom line of hospital profit. But the it's still profitable to the hospital, so they don't complain about it, their um, their sure charges. Pay for it. In the state of Maryland, that's not how it works. In the state of Maryland, the hospitals get paid a lump oh, yeah, sum, yeah, yeah. and then by like capitation, sort of. Yeah, it's a little bit different. So what problems can happen with cervical surgery? It's through your neck, so you can get dysphonia. You can have a problem with your voice. And almost everybody gets some problem, but usually it's mild. It goes away. You can get dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. It's a lot worse at C3, C4. Uh, not as bad going down. I think women are more at risk for it than men. I don't know why. I mean, if I had a theory, probably because women complain all the time. I don't know. That's just a joke. I'm looking at Kimmy when I say that. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, usually it just goes away, but worst case scenario, I did have an elderly man that I had to put a peg in um, f to feed him, big tube feeds, for a month, but it went away. Um, it usually just goes away. So what, can you tell everybody what this is, Adam? This is a uh, single contrast um, swallowing study, mm -hmm. a barium swallowing study. So the, what the white that you can see in the teeth, again, just through x-ray, the stuff there that's bright is metal. And then these so are caps, right? Caps on yeah. his teeth, or yeah. And then, but what's white there is the barium that they're swallowing, because the barium is a big nucleus, and so it absorbs the X-ray, so the film doesn't get exposed. So what it is is it's filling the um, the the oral pharynx, and then uh, down into the esophagus, right where you are, right there, is sort of the base of the esophagus, up a little higher where you were. That's kind of the base of the esophagus of the uh, um, not the esophagus, the uh, epiglottis. Epiglottis. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and so the epiglottis is flipped forward to close off the airway and uh, is being outlined there and so to make sure that the column of uh, contrast goes down the appropriately down the esophagus. Otherwise if it goes down here what happens? You, you're aspirating and you're getting the fluid into your lungs. Yeah, the fluid that you drink goes into your lungs. And um, so right down below that there's a little bit of, right there there's a little narrowing mm -hmm. on both the front and the back within mm -hmm. the uh, esophagus sort of at the origin of the mm -hmm. esophagus so the, uh, you could say maybe the upper esophageal sphincter or something mm -hmm. right there so so this uh, what things could I mean and you can also see the spine is severely diseased you, mm -hmm. can see, you can't really see the disc spaces very well at mm -hmm. all there's a lot of sclerosis in the vertebral bodies the, mm -hmm. the sets are hypertrophic and sclerotic mm -hmm. so it has a fairly severely diseased spine mm -hmm. and and the swallow could potentially tell us if he has a, if there's a tear so let's say people have a hard time swallowing after surgery or there's they have, we you know, you can get an esophageal tear from surgery. Uh -huh. Very uncommon. Uh, I think it's a 0.25 percent, but uh, when it happens, it can be deadly because uh, the infection goes into the lungs, uh, into the mediastinum, and uh, it's a terrible problem. Other complications is you could get a hematoma in your neck. So if you get a bleed in your neck post-op, it could push on your airway, and the patient can die. So that's one reason why I keep everybody overnight, just to make sure their airway is okay. So tell people what, these, what this is, Adam. That is an unhealed fracture in the distal tibia and fibula. Um, you can see sort of above and below the fracture, there's fusion of the tibia and fibula. Um, but it's, so it's a pseudo, as the word up there says, it's a pseudoarthrosis. It's a, a fake articulation mm -hmm. um, th that's not supposed to be there. So those bones are not healing and it's, it, there's motion there. Um, sort of use the patient. That's why you cast or non-weight bearer stay off a fracture so that it can heal and it hasn't happened there. Okay, so these are both non-unions, but they're also kind of different. What do you, um, uh, Doug, how are these two fractures different, other than different bone. They're both non-union and yet they're different non-unions. Um, one is, um, there, there are ways of staging a non-union and one is a hypertrophic non-union on the left. You can see that there's bone healing, mm -hmm. there's an attempted bone healing. Uh-huh, so there's extra bone there. See that extra bone? Mm -hmm. bone circumflexual cortical bone. Uh-huh. So this is fused. 
Uh -huh. The one on the right, I guess, would be a hypotrophic or oligotrophic uh, non-union where there doesn't look like there's any bone. The, the body is not making bone. So those clinically, technically, are more difficult to get to heal mm -hmm. and induce the body to make bone. So this is a hyper and this is a hypo. And so Adam's like, so what? Who cares? What's the difference? How can you treat this differently than this one? Does it make a difference? It's me or Doug? Doug, Doug. Oh yeah, it is a huge difference. Um, you know, the one on the right, technically, if you get the bone to stop moving, it might heal. Uh, the reason it doesn't heal is probably because it has motion and it's not making bone. So, what the hypo one? The humerus? This one? Is that a humerus? Yeah. yeah. So um, that's something that you have to try to um, do uh, some biological manipulation also. You have to try to get the body to make bone. Mm -hmm. By drilling out and taking all this, uh, all this non-union area has to be really debrided and then put bone graft. You have to be very aggressive about the biology of a hypotrophic versus a hypertrophic you can just... Hypertrophic, sometimes if you get the motion to stop, sometimes that can heal, but... Uh, so you don't necessarily have to take out the non-union, you don't necessarily have to put bone graft, you can just put a nail in it, or a plate, or whatever. So they're kind of different for us. So, okay, so Adam, what do you see here? This is a CT scan, uh, sagittal and coronal reformatted images. And you have an anterior fixation plate at the, uh, let's see, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's a plate and screws. Yeah, mm -hmm. plate and screws. Mm -hmm. There's uh, some metal of, of, of yeah, uh, metal. Yeah, actually, I don't know if it, yeah, look, it must be metal. It's so dense. Mm -hmm. At the, the uh, disc space. Um, the this? Yeah. The, no, I, think it, I think this is allograft. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just it's so dense anterior right mm -hmm. there. Um, you may be right, but I think it's allograft. But what else? But right where the, the cursor is, there's mm -hmm. lucency. Um, so there, it has not fused. So this is a non-union. See where the bones didn't come together? Um, so this is, a, this is a case of a non-union. 52-year-old man had a C5, C7 ACDF nine years ago. Now presenting with stenosis above or below is fusion. Is C5, C7 fused, Adam? Well, it's, it, it, uh, you and I have had this discussion before. Is it talks about what when we when you say fusion and what does a fusion mean? And um, from here, I can't say. But meaning, what I, the, the argument of, of language is. First, I have fusion and fixation are sort of two different terms. You could say that the patient has had a fusion because he's had the hardware. Has in had place. a fusion surgery. Yeah, yeah. Right. But is he fused? And the the answer totally is, different. Yeah. And uh, question. I, I think here probably not. I think there is some lucency there, but it's very difficult. You're very say. suspicious though, because I asked you, right? Yeah. But you can't tell. I would say. I cannot tell. Yeah. Okay. So I I would say, what do you think, um, Doug? You think he's fused? But in the latter, it looks like it's fused. That looks fused, right? Yeah. This view? Uh, the level, oh, you're talking about the uh, lower level? Or yeah, both. <laughs> this two level. Fused? And you can see a little bit more on the oblique. Uh, you mm. see the disk space on the upper level. I can't see anything on the Okay. Level. You guys can't tell. All right, how about on the CAT scan, Adam? So now on the CAT scan on the, uh, the right image, you can see the loosened line there um, for the non- uh, fusion, non-osseous fusion, so, and the final radiograph shows that same lucency with the sclerosis on the margins. So he never healed, but this level it's pretty solid. Looks fused, right? Why yeah. do you say it's fused? There is contiguous uh, uh, trabecular bone density. So there used um, to be a disc space here, but now there's nothing, right? So it just goes all the way across. It's like one big long bone. And this space, it didn't go all the way across. It just didn't heal. And the other thing is like these people, they get a hypertrophic non-union, see that? So that, it's in a bad place, it's in the spinal canal. So these patients can present with stenosis and radiculopathy type symptoms from this hypertrophic non-union material when they get uh, cervical non-unions. And this, Adam, is the uh, MRI scan. So this is the C5 screw, this is a C6 screw, this is a C7 screw. And there's this a black line um, above that C7 screw, yeah. Yep. So that, did you find that kind of interesting? So you could have made this diagnosis on the MRI, but it would have been very difficult. 
Okay, so here's, uh, let's do another case. The 55, so any questions about non-unions? Cervical non-unions. Okay, this is another case. A uh, 55-year-old woman uh, who presented uh, November 15th, 2011 to the emergency room with left upper extremity weakness, <laughs> acute onset. Pain and numbness in the superior anterior chest wall, left shoulder, left anterior arm, stopping at the elbow. So the pain's left chest wall, left shoulder, left anterior arm, stopping at the elbow. Eric, what what are you suspicious of any level right now? Well, Hold on, you go right to the x-ray. Hold on, hold on, hold on. But just clinically, left shoulder, left anterior arm, left elbow. What dermatome would you be? Uh, I would say uh, C5. C5 maybe? Okay. So uh, she's a right-hand dominant Frito-Lay worker, and, and when I say Frito-Lay, uh, you know, that's a Pepsi company. Uh, she's like on an assembly line, and she like moves his boxes or something. She had high blood pressure, lipids. She had a bypass surgery where she lost 150 pounds. Uh, left upper extremity, four out of five motor throughout. Left hand dorsal pair seizures, and her hand doesn't work well. So let, let's let uh, Adam read the x-rays because that's a specialty. What do you see on the x-rays, uh, Adam? So uh, at the, uh, let's see, two, three, four, five, at C4, five, there's an anterior listhesis of C4 on C5, um, you know, by probably eight millimeters, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. right there of that listhesis. So, you know, the C5 nerve exits out through the C4, C5 neural foramen. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the foramen that's gonna be torqued and narrowed there is going to be the C4-5, which is where the C5 nerve goes. Mm -hmm. Now looking at this lateral radiograph though, there's no reason why I would expect it to be one side more than the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that I would expect it, it could be, there's no, why not bilateral? I can't. At this point in yeah, time. Yeah, at this mm -hmm. point. Sure. Um, and what other, do you see anything else, Adam? There's some degenerative disc disease with anterior osteophytes. It's 6-7 six, six, and um, Five, six as well. It's five, six, and six, seven. And just on this x ray right now, can you make a little story for us? Like why C4, C5 develops spondylolisthesis? Because of the anterior osteophytes at uh, five, six, six, seven, that they are kind of uh, more rigid, more fused. So she's got to move somewhere. So she moved at uh, four, five. So it's the first mobile segment above a relatively stiff area. Okay. So here's the flexion extensions. Is that. Do you want to add in anything? A little, well, first off, she doesn't move very much between flexion and extension. And secondly, she does reduce with the right film, the extension mm -hmm. film. So it is showing that there is laxity at mm -hmm. that level and excess motion at that level. Can you give? Can you guess why she doesn't move much? Can you right Just now? Muscle spasms. And why does she have muscle spasms? She's protecting her spinal cord to the unicord of unconsciously. She's moving at C1, C2. Yeah. So it's it's a uh, it's a protective reflex. So what do you see here on the so sagittal? Here's a T2 uh, weighted MRI with the CSF being bright, and at the four five level, you can see the cord impingement due to the anterior listhesis of four on five, mm -hmm. and the spinal cord impingement. Mm -hmm. And the cord is, especially the left image, the cord margins are just indistinct. Uh, there, which uh, the signal's not so great, but I would get, we're, that's a little bit increased signal right there, up mm -hmm. on the top, uppermost area mm -hmm. up there. The, the signal's increased, mm -hmm. and again, indicative of more acuity to the disease, that the body is more uh, acutely reacting to the edema and the cord. Okay. Uh, does the CAT scan um, tell the CAT you anything? Scan other than in the, you know, as she's supine on the CAT scan with uh, her head back, you know, it, it reduced mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. It's not looking at. Not as bad, right? Yeah. How about C5, C6? Is this interesting? Is this anterior fusion of osteophytes? Fused. A little bit odd. Yeah. C6, C7 fused? It's, it's not fused, but it's, yeah. And look at, the, look at the stenosis at C6, C7 and C5, C6. Can you explain that? So C5, C6 doesn't have much osteophytes, does no. it? But C6, C7 does. Why doesn't C5, C6 have osteophytes? Because it's, it's fused. It's, it's, fused. Yeah, it's not moving. So it didn't deteriorate. So she deteriorated 6, 7 because C5, C6 is autofused. Um, so you can see that C5, C6 somehow autofused, and she's developing deterioration both above and below that level. Um, so what do you see here, Adam? Uh, here, so.
the three four level C3 C4 levels demonstrating nicely the CSF surrounding the spinal cord on all sides and you go to the C4 C5 level and there's bone and disc material flattening the cord um, displacing the CSF ventral to the cord the neural foramina are narrowed um, on both sides um, then you come down to C5 C6 it doesn't look that bad again so here's the neural foramina just so uh, Adam said it. it's the hole where the nerve runs out so it should be like this right Adam yeah. like good s and see how it's tighter at C4 C5 and we said left side. Does left side look worse than right? Remember, yeah, you're concerned it, about it that. Is. It's not much, but yes, it is more severe than the than the right. So, what do you think of C5, C6? It looks very good, very healthy. And C6, C7. C6, C7 is narrowed. Uh, some of it is from the ligament and flavum, and uh, mm -hmm. posteriorly as well. Here's the ligament and flavum. Anteriorly, mm -hmm. the, uh, the there. Now here, it's hard to talk about the foramen exactly because of what cut it is. You could be, you know, maybe if you were a slice above or a slice below, it would open up. But maybe you're too close to the pedicle, right? Yeah. And you're not in the yeah. middle. Right. So, but judging from this, again, judge, is, you know, assuming these are carefully laid out images. You can't that, assume that, though, but, yeah, but assuming it is. Because 3, 4, and 5, 6 are so good, mm -hmm. um, you know, that the exact right image or correct mm -hmm. image is picked, that uh, you would think the foramina are also narrowed at 6, 7. Okay. So, Eric, what do we do with this patient? How would you treat it? No, 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 we're not doing that. We're surgeons. How are how, how we surgery with you? So, the option would be uh, infusion. Okay, what levels? At 4, 5, and then could uh, leave 5, 6 alone and just bridge it with the plate or move the osteophyte and put a, a graft in as well. Mm -hmm. And also grab 6, 7. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, obviously I'm kidding around. You treat things non-operatively first, but since this is a spine conference, we'll talk about the surgery. So that's exactly uh, what we did. We just fused C4 and C67, and this is already fused. So it's already a success. Why mess with it? And you can see here the spondylolisthesis reduced uh, during the operation um, by drilling it all the way back, and then the patient's laying supine, so they lay back, and then inserting the graft totally reduced the spondylolisthesis. And this is what it looks like uh, a couple months later. Any questions about that case? All right, you guys want to do one more? There's a 77-year-old man, uh, I just saw him in the office actually, I mean in the, in, the, in the hospital, who presented to the hospital with ataxia and bilateral fingertip numbness. He's admitted to medicine, and he got a neuro consult, um, he's been worse in the last two or three months, and he got an MRI of the brain, which was normal. And you're like, well, what, what's the matter with him? Why can't he walk? And his wife says, he's walking like he's drunk, but he's not drunk. So then they, so they admitted him. What do you see on the x-rays, Adam? Four or five. You can see the anterior lysthesis of C4 on C5. Uh -huh. um, and C5, 6, maybe, uh, C6, you know, C5 is a little bit retrolysthesed on C6, mm -hmm. but there's also loss of disc height uh -huh. there. Um, C6, C7, there's a hypertrophic end plates and osteophytes. You can't see them posteriorly, but it's probably extending posteriorly into the spinal canal mm -hmm. pretty well. Do you remember what the last case was? Is this the same case? Different, but similar. But similar pr level pretty eerie, pathology. right? Yeah. yeah, C5, C6 looks all diffused, yeah. right? C6, C7 is arthritic, and C4, C5 is spondylolisthesis. Don't you find that a little creepy? It's common. I mean, it's it's, uh, it's common. Huh? It's, it's the common levels. Mm -hmm. Common levels deteriorate. To happen. So C4, C5, the spondylolisthesis is an autofusion at C5, C6, and a large anterior ossified at C6, C6, C7, and C7, T1 is spondylolisthesis. I'll show you. So, so C, go ahead, go ahead, Adam. Two MR. Mm -hmm. And actually, his, you can see if we go down to, if you put your cursor at four five, go, yeah, four five. There is disease there, but you can see how he's impinging his cord more tightly above at three four. Mm -hmm. um, there is a little bit. That of looked anterior. normal in the X-ray, didn't it? A little, yeah, a, a, a little bit of anterior lysthesis of three on four. Okay, just a little bit. Okay. Uh, but that is where his, his cord impingement is, uh, is most severe. Mm -hmm. um, that, that yes, there's the, the four or five disease, but you can see in the spinal canal is uh, more widely patent. The mm -hmm. lower you get, the wider it gets generally. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is this black thing? Uh, it's a sort of a, a it's ligamentum flavum kind of obliquely cut. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whenever you see, the, you see the stuff like that on the 
sagittals and then you kind of eagerly go to the axials expecting to see some weird big thing there and it's almost never there mm -hmm. and it's just if you think about the the lamina are, are a triangle they're at angles um, and so that's just catching it at the angle because there really isn't something posteriorly there bulging in it's just the oblique angle um, you think that's artifact well it's real there there it's real ligamentum flavum there from the lamina but it isn't a it isn't a big bulging into the spinal canal. It's not as big as you would expect to see on the axial cut, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but for me, it's of concern. I was like, hmm, I wonder if this is a well, posterior it problem. Well, matters, and, and, when you, and it always does affect when you measure the anterior posterior mm -hmm. dimension of the spinal canal. It is narrow. So that's at 3, 4. Let's see but if you're right. You like, never see. Is it hypertrophic at 3, 4 from the ligament of flavum, Adam? Not really, no. I mean, they're on the right. But there's something there, there's though. There's something there, yeah. yeah. But not, like you said, you'd expect a lot worse. Yeah. Okay, and what other things can you add from this? Uh, uh, six, seven, there's uh, bone dismaterial flattening the ventral portion of the middle sac, uh, mm -hmm. butting the cord, maybe flattened, uh, displacing it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just asymmetry of the cut that our left neural foramen is so wide and our mm -hmm. right is, and I think you're actually just in the pedicle and mm -hmm. the spine. It's not so a little scoliosis, symmetric. yeah. yeah. And C5 looks pretty good, right? Yes. So um, what do we do with um, this guy, um, Eric? Well, you can take the choice of a uh, longer construct on the anterior circumfusion from 3 to T1. So C 3 to T1, that's pretty big, isn't it? And why do you want to go down the 1? Because it's spondylolisthesis. The spondylolisthesis. So you're, how about if we stop at 7? Then it'll break down faster at 7. So you'd be worried that C71 will continue to deteriorate. How, um, how about stopping at 6? Well, then you're going to break down 6-7. Six, 6-7 seven. Seven may break down. It already has some arthritic, yeah. How about stopping at 5? Well, the same problem because it's hard to use the 5-6. So it's going to put more torque on 6-7. 6-7, yeah. Okay, so ACDF C3 to T1, what was going on in that theory? If you're going to do four, then you're just creating a, a lever at the top or the bottom of your fused mass, right? It's a long construct. It's a long. I mean, the longer you make it, the more lever on you put where it is, right? Right. The higher the likelihood of deterioration, higher non union risks. It's a difficult case, what to do. He needs something because he can't walk. I mean, definitely C3, C4, C4, C5 definitely needs surgery. So. In this case, I just did C3 to C5, and for C5, C6, C6, C7, C7, T1, I'm going to just treat that with intense prayer. I'm just going to hope to God it doesn't deteriorate. But I told him that there's a chance he may need further surgery. So I just saw him back, and he's unbelievable. He's like, what? I don't even remember having a problem. He's like, he's like I feel fine. I don't need to come back to see you, do I? I was like, nah, you're probably all right. So, so he's, uh, I sort of let him loose. But I'm wondering in my mind, is, is he going to need these fixed in the future? But so far, it's a home run. But it's uh, unfortunately, you know, that's not the end of the game. Like, the end of the game is the end of his life. So what's going to happen in his future, I'm not sure. But chances are he's going to be fine. So I just limited the surgery. Otherwise, it would have been a pretty big reconstruction, like uh, Eric was saying. It would have been a front back and a lot of risks. Um, that's it. That's the end of the lecture. So uh, who says... This is, this is how we're doing state by state. This is us, we're blue right now. And uh, who thinks, who's gonna win the election? Don, what do you think? Obama. Obama? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well there we have it, Obama's gonna win the election. All right, <laughs> thank everybody for coming. Any, any questions?